Thank you all also for being here. I know it's a rainy day. Um, and maybe before we get started, let's give a big hand for Paul Schrader because <laughs> because we can't actually see any of your facial reactions. So we need a little bit of to understand where we are emotionally <laughs> with our talk here. Um, I want to start by talking about Master Gardener, but I want to do so by going back to something you said when you made Blue Collar. And I'll read you a quote, and I'll quickly say, in no way am I saying that Master Gardener is a left film, but I think this quote is apt in talking about the film. You said, but I don't feel you should pre prejudge that theme. Otherwise, your movie becomes the acting out of a preset dogma, rather than arriving at it through a natural sequence of character exploration. That, to me, is the danger of so many left films. They know the thesis before they know the characters, and the characters never live up to that thesis. And it has to work the other way around to have any dramatic sense. The left films I like are the ones that love their characters. And I'd love to hear about the creation process for the film in general, but also where did these characters come from? Yeah, uh, left was the word she's using. I like your shoes, by the way. <laughs> um, the... Um, Blue Collar, the first film I directed, and it ended up uh, with a Marxist conclusion, and I was on the cover of City Ask at that time, and I was the new uh, fair-haired boy of left Marxist cinema, and that the origin of that quote is saying, you know, it's not really true. I made a film which had a Marxist conclusion, but it doesn't mean I would come to that conclusion in another situation. And um, and so uh, and in the whole political context, um, Master Gardner um, has to date engendered less controversy than I thought it might, because basically it lets uh, one of the most villainous characters in our current culture, the white supremacist, kind of skate. Uh, because it aligns him with uh, other characters I've written uh, who are defined by their occupations, whether it be a taxi driver, a drug dealer, uh, a car player, uh, a gardener. And uh, so, um, in fact, when I first had the idea, which always sort of starts with an a sense of an occupation that has complexity in it. What kind of person would be a gardener? What kind of person would be a card player? And what's the metaphorical richness of that occupation? I'm not really interested in poker any more than I'm interested in, in cab driving. But I'm interested in the, the metaphorical uh, richness of an occupation. Uh, taxi driver, for example, at that time, People assume that there was a cliche of a taxi driver being garrulous and funny and like your your husband's brother, you know. And I looked at him and I said, "No, this is the black heart of Dostoevsky. This is a, 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 a man imprisoned in a yellow steel box, uh, you know, floating through the sewer." So you realize the richness of the metaphor when you see where else it can go. And so I, I started thinking about a gardener, and uh, and, um, and and then this uh, the whole sort of racial. Uh, I, and I like the idea of having t two women. As I said to somebody, you know, what if Sybil Shepherd and Jodie Foster could have coffee? What would happen? And so you know, have these two women. And, um, but at that time, the character was a mobster who had ratted out his fellow mafiosos. And I was a little concerned about the May-December thing, that people were gonna, because of political correctness, were gonna bust me about this guy having a romance and affair with a woman old enough to be his daughter, and another one old enough to be his mother. And uh, so I thought, well, 
maybe we can dodge that uh, Lolita thing by making him a proud boy because then people get so <laughs> fucked up about him being a proud boy <laughs> they won't think about the, uh, the age discrepancy thing. <laughs> and then when people, I, 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 then I finally said to the producer, I said, you know, if we really want to get around the whole proud boy thing and get people not talking about that, let's cast Kevin, Kevin Spacey. Because then they'll only, <laughs> then they'll only talk, talk about Kevin. But he, I couldn't get him to go that far. Well, that's, I mean, that's worked historically. I think it's Psycho where he, with the censors, made it a little worse so that he would have what he wanted remaining in the film. Well, it's not a case of censorship here because I have Final Cut and everything like yeah. that. It's a question of not getting too pigeonholed by, you know, particularly in our, our day of social media, it's very easy to have somebody put something out there and then get it repeated and repeated and tell us all. I mean, it was pointed out to me by Focus. They were re releasing a film called um, Stillwater with Matt Damon. And Matt made an uh, interview with The Guardian where he mentioned that words he had used as a young man about homosexuals, faggots, and his d children pointed out that are no longer acceptable. Well, there you had it. You had the ability to put the, the words, three words, Matt, David, and faggot in the same sentence. And that took over the news cycle on that film for two days. And Focus said, we lost two days of really uh, of a promotion because we were, all we were doing was Matt Damon faggot. And so you have to really be careful of that in this era of social media that you don't feed the click hungry wolves some raw meat that uh, they wouldn't have had otherwise. Maybe that's a good, well, I'd also love to know a little bit more about maybe the Sigourney Weaver character who you didn't touch on yet. Uh, well, uh, the, uh, The, you know, I, I like, uh, I, I like the idea of the, uh, uh, normally these characters kind of tend to move around from place to place, but now, he, so he's now sedentary. So you, you need constant characters. And, uh, and I like the idea of that, uh, this landowner. But in fact, um, her character became a little nastier in the editing process because when he first goes to her bedroom and she says, um, you first take off your clothes, I wanna look at you. Now I had not yet revealed his tattoos. So you, she's looking at him and you, don't quite know what she's looking at. And then the editing process, I realized that that was, it was more interesting than if she did know. So I, I moved the chronology around so that there is a reveal of his Nazi tattoos before. So now, the whatever you read into her face uh, changed because now you know what she's looking at. Before you didn't know what she was looking at. So now it's sort of like a Charlotte Rampling thing you're waiting for her to put on the cap. And uh, so, but, uh, uh, so, uh, yeah, I mean, it is, um, uh, you know, it's a treat to work with Sigourney and also, you know, there's not a lot of really, there's, you know, there's a, a, quite a few actresses in that age category, and there's, n there's more actresses than roles. And uh, so uh, originally, uh, Glenn Close is a lifelong friend of my wife, and Glenn would always would say to me, why don't you write something for me? And I, you know, I did, that's not really what I kind of write. And then I started writing this, oh, I have a role for Glennie. So I, I gave it, I called Glennie, I finally got a role for you. And, 
finally offered it to her and she turned it down. <laughs> so she doesn't ask me why I don't write for her anymore. Uh, and so I went to Scordy. Speaking of writing, um, at a screening of Light Sleeper earlier in the week, you talked about how for that film, you had real people that you knew that kind of were the Susan Sarandon character and were the Willem Dafoe character and hanging out with them and developing those characters that way. And I'm curious more about what is the writing process like when you maybe don't have those specific people in mind and well, when you don't have models like that. It's not really so much model. I mean, you do want a certain amount of verisimilitude. You don't want to get nailed. And, you know, and there are people who if you do something wrong, will catch you. But on the other hand, research can be a real crutch to not writing. You can eventually research the idea of death and you never write it. So you just research enough to pass. So you have to know enough about gardens you know, to make people think I know more, you know. <laughs> um, and with the, the drug dealing thing, you know, it was, not, it was just really a matter of spending, um, you know, a night with them and just sort of seeing their ritual, you know, how they did things, how the night progressed. And then, uh, and then Willem went out with John uh, one day and did deliveries. And Willem said to me, it was so interesting because they would go into an apartment here in New York to do a drug exchange and the customer would recognize Willem. <laughs> <laughs> but the customer would be afraid to say anything because I might blow the deal. I might squirrel the deal and he wouldn't get his drugs. And so Willem said, you could see him say, really wanting to say, aren't you Willem Dafoe? But he was afraid that the moment he said that, Willem would walk out and the deal would be gone. <laughs> so they had to choose between shaking a celebrity's hand and getting you know, their bindle. And obviously, any of us would make the same choice. <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about, in Master Gardener, but also maybe in the last three films, about humor and tension. And I kind of, even though I think people on a, you know, are calling the last three films a trilogy of sort, for me, they're kind of inseparable from Dog Eat Dog <laughs> in, a, in a multitude of ways. Um, and I mean, there's your team. That's when you started working with your cinematographer and your editor. Um, but I found a quote that you said about Dog Eat Dog, um, about giving the audience permission to laugh in that first scene and being really conscious about letting the audience know that they were allowed to laugh and how important that was for Dog Eat Dog. And I want to know how, if at all, does humor work in these, for you, in these last three films? Dog Eat Dog is obviously very maximalist and very outgoing, and the, the, the last three had a different tone, and I think it could be easy, especially maybe if you're watching it alone, just to... Yeah, I mean, Dog Eat Dog is Tarantino and Guy Ritchie, <laughs> uh, which these others aren't. Uh, and um, you know, the, the most important thing is that you get, you have to teach the viewer how to watch the movie which is why I like credits, because the audience gives you about two or three minutes of free time if you have credits. They won't give you five minutes, you can't, credits can't go on forever, but they'll give you a few minutes. And you can use that time to just say, this is gonna be wacky, this is gonna be somber, this is gonna be poetic, you know. And I, I refer to it as the the sound the, the um, roller coaster makes as it climbs to the ascent. Uh, you know, everybody is there waiting. You're hearing the click, the click, the click. And by the time you get to the top, you know what's going to come. And uh, so, you know, like these films, you really try to get the viewer into a slow place. This is going to be a warm bath. This is not a cold shower. And uh, so that's the first thing you're doing. And then every once in a while, you have to uh, spice it up, sometimes uh, with a little comedy, or in the case of these last three films, a phantasmagorical sequence, 
which is a levitation, or a colorful wonderland, or in the case of Gardner, all of nature coming into bloom. And this lifts the story from the prosaic, because a lot of it is just day-to-day -day stuff. I did this, I did that, you know, flowers come bloom. And to sense that there is another world, you know, running parallel to the world of these characters, and it's right there. And occasionally, you can reach over and touch it. And occasionally, you can look over and you can see that there is another world. And those, so that's what those scenes are, reminders of that. Uh, these characters have been living in this world, but there is another one, uh, and which takes it out of reality. So in a way, it's the same thing as comic relief. It just bounces you off. These films also mark kind of a change in your career, maybe what I would maybe call the no bullshit era in terms of financing and having control over the films and just being like, I'll work smaller, but I'm going to do it my way. And which is something not a lot of older filmmakers and filmmakers in general, I think, are willing to do. Um, and I'm curious about kind of the differences in having such a short shoot in terms of working with your actors, in terms of the time you can spend developing things. You get the final cut, but obviously you have less time on set. Yeah, I mean, a lot of filmmakers of my generation, and you know their names, uh, fall dangerously in love with the big toys. And the big toys are extras, budget, uh, construction, uh, cranes, all those things. And you pay for the big toys. Uh, you know, you, you get a longer shooting schedule, you get a big budget, but in the end, you, you're held to a higher financial measurement. And so, um, once technology shifted and it became possible to shoot a film that used to be shot at 45 days and shot now at 20 days, which is essentially the same film. Uh, you're just shooting a lot faster, but you're shooting, you're putting sometimes even more quote unquote film, you know, in the camera. Uh, and so that frees you from this sense of um, a stewardship that you feel when you're essentially conning people into saying that this film is going to have a bigger audience than it does. And now all of a sudden you, you get that price point down to two, three million, four million. You say, you know, I mean, this film, I, 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 I can't promise I'll make you rich. In fact, I, I won't make you rich. But I can, with honesty, tell you I think you're going to make your money back. And I mean, and that's, that's all my sense of stewardship demands. Uh, and so I can do that and then you get the final cut. And of course, once you get uh, final cut, you're under another taskmaster. <laughs> the, uh, the, ta you know, the, other one t the old taskmaster is you have to get the approval from d daddy, the bank. But when you have final cut, the only proof you really need to get is from yourself. And I remember that feeling when I was shooting Mishima in Japan, and I realized that the financing of that film was very odd, and the people who financed it were now claiming they didn't finance it for political reasons in Japan. And Warner Brothers was involved, but they didn't care about it because they were doing a favor to George Lucas. And so I just realized that nobody finances this movie. <laughs> <laughs> and that I can do anything I want. And of course, then enormous weight descended on me because I said, I can do it. There's nobody to blame. <laughs> Usually you make a film, you say, well, I, we had to make some compromises. We had to put some asses in the seat. We had to, you know, put some violence. And, and you know, we had to sign. You know, I said, well, no, we don't have to do any of those things. And uh, so there's no way to 
no way to uh, kind of defend yourself from your own inadequacies, but to say, you know, if you fucked up, you have to say, actually, I fucked up. If not, you know, the evil people made me fuck up. It's interesting because I've, I've always loved or been deeply interested in classic Hollywood, one of the reasons being that you saw people working with a lot of limitations. You know, they're given very set budgets. They're not even, sometimes couldn't even choose their actors. I always think of Max Ophels, um, who on Reckless Moment, and a lot of his movies would get ahead on his shooting schedule so then he could spend like three days doing a tracking shot through the boathouse. Um, and what I see in kind of maybe a finance, like limitation in general, but maybe in a financial limitation is the possibility for those things to inspire creativity. And I'm curious if that's something you found, because well, you're yeah, really it, forced. Well, you have to learn to cut in the camera. Uh, you know, so that the old me method of establishing master, reverse master, cover one side of the line, cover the other side. You take a full day to do a scene. Well, you're not going to do that scene in a half a day. And you're going to cut in the camera. And you're going to say, OK, uh, we got that. You know. We don't need that. We don't. I'm not going to use that. And and, and so now you're doing splices in your head, um, and you're pulling the plug. You're saying, "We've got this scene. You know, we've got an hour and a half. I think we can run and get that establishing shot. I've always wanted to get, but I didn't think we'd, we could fit in the schedule. But if I pull the plug on this scene, I'll run and get that. So that's what you're. Uh, how you're thinking, and. Um, and very much like old folks, if you have in mind, you have to decide on your really big shots. You can't do them every day. And not only you can't afford the equipment, if you're going to lay in a, a techno crane, a steady cam, uh, any kind of crane, you're only going to rent it for that day or two days. So you have to be ready to use it on that day. And, and then it's going to go away again. So you say, well, what can I do to uh, make sure I get that techno crane day? And, uh, you know, and also, um, you know, um, I, I'm working from shorter and shorter scripts. Uh, these last three films, the scripts are around 80 pages. Now, we used to have this thing where it was a page a, a page a minute. So your scripts were supposed to be, I started out writing 120 page scripts, so it dropped to 112, and then, then 109, and now I'm into the 80s. Uh, and they're just as long, uh, but I've learned, because in that 112 page script, 20 of those pages would hit the cutting room floor. So you just have to figure out which 20 pages are going to get cut out. And cut them out before you shoot them, rather than after you shoot them. And so if a scene is essentially dead, just say, I think this scene is dead. Let's not shoot it. And another person says, well, how do you know? Well, you don't. And sometimes you make a mistake, and sometimes you say, we cut that scene out, and we really needed that scene. And we cut this out, we really needed that. But you, know, you have to make those calls, otherwise you can't make those budgets. One thing I have always appreciated about you, and it, it comes through now maybe in your Facebook posts, which I read on Twitter. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> which, there you go, that's already a statement, yeah. is your honesty and your ability to talk about money in relation to filmmaking, which, you know, it, your, your story about who fi no one financed this film, you know, money is often just pushed to the side. We, it's not discussed. And as a filmmaker myself, that can be extremely frustrating. Um, and I found an interview with you from 1976, and you, you were talking about being at AFI. And you were talking about, you were just very angry at how they were spending money and the parties they were throwing and the money being misused and that Weiler would show up regardless of the party. He'd show up to a crappy apartment because he took cinema seriously. Um, but by the same token, you know, we're here at the New York Film Festival. Tickets are $30 to see a movie. Um, inflation's at an all-time high. And for your small movies, though, 
they need a festival. You were, I think it was Card Counter, or maybe it was First Reformed, you talked about how um, in the exhibition process, art films, small films like yours, need festivals in order to get the word out. So people will, on their streaming service, go, oh, that's a good movie, because they're not going to necessarily go, oh, Ethan Hawke is a priest. I want to watch that. Yeah. No, I mean, you know, I, I think I read about a week ago that there were 67 films coming out yet this year. That's a lot of films. Uh, how do you get your head above the crowd? Well, festivals, you know, and uh, I am uh, been a product of festivals from the day of Taxi Driver Con till now. Uh, and I've been very fortunate. To, uh, there's always been a few festivals. So sometimes you get them all with first reform. Sometimes you get two or three of them you know, in terms of the fall, the, the fall circuit. And, uh, but it does begin the process of separating you from the multitude of things that come on the streaming service. And, uh, you know, so you have a film like Card Counter, it goes to some festivals, picks up some attention, and then ex-President Obama, who was in charge of the government in terms of Abu Ghraib, puts it on his 10 best list. <laughs> So now people, you know, all of a sudden they see it, it pops up on HBO, they say, oh yeah, 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 I heard about that film. And that's all you can ask. Uh, it's just that little bit of uh, edge on the film that they haven't heard about. Uh, because theatrical is really, at this point in time, uh, like setting the table. And, and you know, a handful of films make money theatrical and there are still to me, there are four excuses left for theatrical. But apart from that, we are living in a streaming universe. Do you go to the theater? Um, well, it certainly has become harder after uh, COVID. Yeah. You know, because once you tr learn not to go, uh, and once you realize how much of the high quality stuff is, is right there, you know, you don't have to go to see it. Um, you know, it gets a little harder, and then it starts to become, does it fit one of the, the four levels or criteria, which to me, uh, the four reasons left for theatricals are spectacle, and that will only increase as we get more spectacle, uh, you know, 3D, sense around, whatever is coming. Uh, the other is uh, date movies, which is essentially, can you can I get my arm around her? Horror, uh, uh, rom com. There's also there's always be that excuse. Uh, then there's children's movies. Parents love to see their kids laughing with other kids, so that's valuable. And then there's essentially club cinema, which is what we're in now. Uh, or like the Burn Center, or, or like uh, the Metrograph, you know, which actually has more uh, seats committed to eating and drinking than it does to movie watching. Um, <laughs> but that's part of uh, a good way that uh, cinema has been able to stay vibrant and so that the martini is now the new popcorn. I will say on a, maybe a, a positive note, and I can't make much meaning of this quite yet, um, post-pandemic, um, at Anthology, where they still do essential cinema, you can go see Carl, we just did a Bresson cycle, and we just did a dryer retro, and we had massive amounts of young people showing up to see those prints, and it felt very, it felt nice, I don't know, I don't know what it yeah. means, but it was a nice, but, a nice thing. <laughs> but I mean, but that is also club, that's yeah. a club cinema, and, and they go because, they want to be part of that club. Uh, it's not like going to the multiplex to see a bracelet. <laughs> That's true. Uh, maybe this is a good time to talk about a film you made almost 10 years ago. I mean, I'll say film. It's one of my favorite things that you've made. And it's, I think, the last thing you made in New York, which is your Venice Reloaded trailer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, and in it, you talk about crisis of form, 
Um, there is no content without form, and you can't make a revolutionary film in the middle of a revolution. And I'm curious how you feel about those ideas 10 years later. Well, it's, it's like right now. I mean, obviously a lot of great films are being written in the Ukraine right now, but you can't make them for another five years. I mean, you can't. And, uh, and, uh, and so we are, we have been in a, a revolution of, uh, of what a movie means, you know, the definition of what is a movie. And so it's, it has been kind of hard to make a movie when the definition keeps changing. You know, is Mad Men a movie? Yeah, yeah, I think Mad Men is a movie. Is that uh, YouTube thing about the cat that got stuck in the door, a movie? Yeah, that's a movie too. <laughs> uh, and so is everything in between. <coughs> so, um, uh, you know, and, and to be judgmental, you know, we used to say, oh, a movie is, is an hour and a half to two and a half hours, and it takes place in a darkened room with a projected image. Well, that's certainly not true anymore. Yeah. You know, you can, I, I see people, you know, watching movies on their phone in the subway, and uh, and the first time I saw it, I thought, well, that's weird. And, and then I realized that it's not weird anymore. You know, everybody's doing it. Um, I'm going to ask a, a, a quick side note, and then I'm going to continue that thought. I have to ask, though, why the bike helmet on the High Line and why the fluorescent green bike helmet when you, when you made that? <laughs> <laughs> it was probably the only one we could get. Uh, I mean, I mean, what I did was I stuck all kinds of uh, GoPros. GoPros all around me because we were entering, at that time, the era of uh, multicam uh, mini cams, uh, which is now uh, more and more with the high quality of small cameras you're, you're seeing. Uh, you know, I mean, Tony Scott used to line up six 35 mil cameras with different lenses, different. But you don't have to line up. You know, more and more you're seeing films that are being shot with four, five, eight, ten cameras. You know, just stick a camera, stick one up there, stick one over there, put one over there, and see what we get. And uh, that changes. Uh, it also changes the other way, which is, let's be monastic about this, let's use one camera, and let's cut the camera. Or the other approach is, let's be scattershot, let's shoot everything, throw it into the editing room, and take a run for it. In terms of kind of this, what feels like an unending transitional moment of cinema, of not knowing what cinema is, and obviously cinema's always been fluid, it's always been shifting and changing. You watch a nitrate print, I mean, when I've gone to watch nitrate prints, you watch it and you're like, wow, movies <laughs> really were different. Like you, it's so palpable. Um, and then today we just have this crisis of form um, that you're talking about. And there's a phrase I have often thought about ever since I read it in your introduction to transcendental style in film, and that is of the imprecise critic. Um, and I'm wondering a little bit about this crisis of form and film criticism. Because something that I, I often get frustrated by or think about is that people are watching movies in a myriad of ways, and yet criticism is still treating a movie like a like the same object that it was 50 years ago. There's no mention of how people are watching things typically when they write. And I'm wondering, I guess, what you think of that, but also what you think of the state of film criticism today. Well, I mean, the problem with film criticism is the problem with audiences. I mean, there are, you know, why were say the 60s and 70s, such a rich period for uh, films? Because there were good audiences. And then why were there good audiences? Because there were pressing issues that people wanted addressed in the movies. Uh, gay liberation, militarism, f female uh, emancipation, civil rights. And they said, Look, oh, they made a movie about it. Let's go see Ted and Carol and Ted and Oz. Let's see Bonnie and Clyde. Um, well, we don't have that lobby anymore. 
movie theaters used to be shown in the lobby and everybody came down from their rooms. Now everybody stays in their rooms and they watch uh, on their um, electronic devices. And there is no meeting place. And once the meeting place is gone, the audience, the pressure is off the filmmakers to solve that audience problem. And so now they just solve all the niche problems. You know, let's take care of room 704. Somebody else will do room 532. And, um, and therefore, when you don't have those audiences, you don't have the movies. And then you don't have the filmmakers. And then you don't have the critics. And you know, so when that beast stumbles, the four legged the four legs crumple up, and one leg is not going to get it standing again. The critics alone aren't going to do it. Theatrical isn't going to do it. You know, <laughs> filmmakers aren't going to do it, and economics isn't going to do it. Somehow you have to get it up by using all four legs, and so you know that the moment films become a important, more important because it's hard to make important films when audiences don't think they're important. Audiences think films are more important, you're going to get better criticism. You get better criticism, you're going to get better audiences, you're going to get better finances. And those things came together uh, during that uh, sort of period when, uh, when film was uh, freed by, essentially freed by the birth of the teenager in the 50s. Uh, because it, it, we didn't used to have teenagers. We just had <laughs> young people who had to go to work early. Um, and then after World War II and all our wealth, we had teenagers, and then we had consumer culture, and then we had leisure time, and all of a sudden we had a whole new definition of movies. And out of that came, you know, this whole independent cinema and the breakdown of the movie as a manufacturing line product. And, but then that went away, too. Well, I'm just scattering all over the place here. Uh, I end right there. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds good. I mean, it's, if you could speak concisely about this stuff, I would be concerned, because it, it's not, it's just, it's very scattershot time. <laughs> yeah, well, I was just pointing out on Facebook recently, uh, uh, Bill Jaibri, you know, was, has been promoting Athena, you know, with those, quote unquote long takes, which are not in fact long takes, but are <laughs> full of hidden splices and stitching. And, um, and I made a point that the, the era of the long take is now over. There was an era once, you know, whose take was longer, yours or mine, the era of the Touch of Evil opening or Goodfellas uh, and uh, Soy Cuba. But that it is now possible for anybody to stitch together these takes. And so therefore, a long take is no longer some kind of technical accomplishment. It's just another tool. You want to do a long take? Let's do a long take. And we'll stitch it together. It's no different now than a flash cut. You want to use a flash cut? Use a flash cut. You want to use a long take? Use a long take. But that notion of technical achievement uh, as an arbiter uh, artistic achievement no longer means as much anymore. You know, it's also the, the true is of, of cinematography. I mean, there used to be a handful of great cinematographers, and but now with all the work we do in post, and m most of cinematography is now done in post, uh, I can take somebody out of film school, show them. A Darius Kanji or a, a Storaro or whatever, and say, okay, knock that off. And by and large, they can, they can knock it off because they'll just figure out how it was done and then they'll do what they need to do on the set and the rest they do in post. And so most of the films you are now watching are being remade. Uh, sometimes the post schedule is longer than the shooting schedule, well, all times it's longer than the shooting schedule, but sometimes it's really longer uh, that you'll shoot for two months and then post for a year. Uh, and everything gets remade. And now that you can shoot at 6K, 4K, 6K, even 8K, that means you can recompose in post. So I shoot this angle here. I shoot it at 8K. Well, what am I shooting? Well, I'm shooting this, but it's also I'm shooting that. 
I'm shooting that, I'm shooting that. And I could pan around that image without any loss of quality because I'm only projecting at 2K. Uh, and also, I can shoot a loose angle on you and say, I got the single too. Because the single will be also of sufficient digital uh, denseness to be projected. And so, um, you know, we're living more and more in a post world. Uh, and, uh, but, and that just opens up uh, other opportunities. Okay, well, I, I have one, I have a last question, but I'm gonna wait to ask it, but I wanna open it up to the audience for a few minutes. So who do we have, is there a mic? Okay, you, who wants to ask a question then? Who wants the mic? No one? Come on, you all got here super early. You have no questions? So like when you, when you see the Revenant, you see all this wonderful, you think there were no microphones and no extras and no crew standing in those shots? They were shooting wide open. And then they were just re, reformatting, you know, uh, afterwards. Uh, hello, I wanted to ask about your process with your composers. Uh, so, whether it was Mishima with Philip Glass or your latest work, when does the composer get involved? What's the uh, process? Uh, well, Mishima was an exception because um, um, Tom Luddy, the producer, had been involved with Koyana Scotsi, so he knew Phil. And Phil had done th three operas, biographical operas, uh, Gandhi and Einstein. And who was the third one? Sachigraya, Einstein on the beach. You should know that, they all play right here. <laughs> um, and so we approached Phil as doing it as an opera. And so he essentially scored the film from the script, then rescored it from the film, uh, the cut. Other than that, usually it starts to occur to you somewhere while you're shooting. Uh, so, like Light Sleeper said, wouldn't it be nice, you know, have a, a, another voice for this character? He has a narrative voice, a dialogue voice, he has a narration voice, but give him a third voice, which is a singing voice. So you start thinking about that. Um, this film um, with uh, Dev Hines, um, Well, that was very interesting because I was drawn to him because he is a, a, a wunderkind. He does everything. J jazz, rap, blood orange, classical. Um, and he didn't, but he didn't have, hadn't done that much electronic. And so I thought it would be really interesting. Well, I was, it ended up being a kind of stressful situation because I was, he really wasn't working where he was most comfortable. Uh, he's most comfortable on the on the piano and not most comfortable on on electronics, just working purely electronically. So that was interesting, and uh, and it was a, when you get new composers. So the first two was Jack Nietzsche, the second two was George Moroder. Went over to Scott Johnson, uh, David Grohl, uh, Michael uh, Affliction. Well, anyway, um, m no, that was Michael Bean was light sleeper, uh, and Robert Bean was his son was a card counter, uh, but the electronic uh, composer did a, a Affliction, and anyway. When you get new people, it's always interesting, and it, but it's very work, and then, because if I hire an old veteran composer, and I, I did this once and regretted it, you get his greatest hits or her greatest hits. They've solved, you present them with a problem, they've solved this problem two dozen times already. They know exactly the solution. And they even know the permutations of the solution. You give it to a young composer who hasn't worked much in film, if at all, 
They're thinking, well, how do I solve that problem? You know, here's the old dark house problem. You know, here's the, the, the girl alone on the street problem. Uh, how am I going to solve it? I know how they solved it historically. You know, but how will I solve it? So you do get uh, interesting work, but it is very labor intensive because you end up spending a lot of time with them because with a regular Hollywood composer, they usually have a staff and, uh, and you know, they just chug it out. Uh, you know, sometimes, you know, the composer is just essentially giving notes to his team. Um, so I, I've always been tempted by, uh, first time I used uh, uh, Lusmord in uh, First Reformed, I don't think. Uh, Brian Williams, I don't think he's ever done anything else. You know? And so it's always fun when you're using somebody for the first time. Do we have one more? Oh, no. Um, I'm going to go with the, wait, is that a Celtic? No, I'm, you have a Celtic sweatshirt. I can't choose you. I'm from, I'm from Cleveland. I can't choose you. Um, I'll go with you. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm a cat stand. What is your process with the actors? How long do you rehearse? Do you work strictly from the script? Do you improvise? Uh, what is your process? Uh, it changes. But rehearsal is absolutely essential. Uh, rehearsal is your playtime. You need at least one week, uh, preferably two weeks. This can be kind of costly if they're coming in from out of town. Uh, but rehearsal is your chance to play. You don't really have time to play on set. So you can explore. You can say, you know, we're doing this scene in the coffee shop. What if they were doing it in bed? Same dialogue. Lie down on the floor and do the scene as if you're lying on a bed talking to each other. How does it change the scene from the coffee shop scene? Did, did we learn anything about the scene from doing it in this way? So those are the kinds of play you can have in a rehearsal. And also, you really, uh, actors tend to, to think they know a thing, and then rehearsal you, you, it forces them to really think about it. Uh, also, uh, it, you know, there is no such thing as improvisation in a film. Uh, there is in rehearsal. You can improvise. But on set, there's very little improvisation, and the very few times it actually happens, it, it, when it's so good, what do you think happens next? They do it again. So no, is that improvisation the second time? Or is that just a rewrite? It's a rewrite. So like the famous scene in Rain Man where Tom Cruise and Dustin Hoffman are in a phone booth and Tom Cruise passes gas. And he says, oh, I'm sorry, I passed gas. And Dustin, rather than break the take, brings it into his character. And he talks about pass gas, pass gas. Well, that's a magical moment. But is that really improvised when they do it the second time? And when they do it the third time, they say, that's so good, let's, let's get it better. Or like the um, famous scene in uh, Goodfellas where Pesci is talking about shooting the guy in the foot. Now, that wasn't in the script. And I've read online that it was improvised. It was not improvised. They were in rehearsals. And, uh, during a break, uh, Pesci was telling the story he heard. Marty heard the story and said, hey, that's a better story than we have in the script. Let's use that story instead in the scene. And so now they're telling it in the scene. And now it becomes part of the script. Now, is that improvised? I don't think so. Cassavetti would spend eight days rehearsing his quote unquote improvised scenes. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have one more out there? I think we have time for one more. I'm gonna go you in the back. Test. Uh, thank you for being here, Mr. Schrader. Um, when you're one to two drafts in, let's say, on a new script, when you're trying to apply your theme to that script, is it more deliberate or is it more trial and error when you're trying to let it permeate the script in a way? 
Well, um, I've talked about the writing process. Uh, I think this secret of screenwriting, which is not really writing at all, um, is the oral tradition preparation. Everything you can do to keep yourself from writing is good. Keep telling it, thinking about it, thinking about it, until one of two things happen. Either the idea dies on you, which is a good thing because you've not wasted time writing it, or the idea gets so frustrated that it says, enough of this, let's go to work. And then it comes very fast because it's been just pent up. Uh, so you're talking about one draft. The first draft ideally should go very fast, you know, and it should not be that long. If you can tell a story at 70 pages, it's going to work at 90. Uh, just get it out there. Let it go. When, when a young writer says to me, I, I want you to read something, I don't think it's very good, but I, I did it in the last week. I said, well, let me see that. And the writer comes to me and says, I've been working on this thing three years. Would you read it? And I go, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so that uh, you get that first draft out there, and you know there's another level. And so you sort of think about it, and all of a sudden you figure out, I can get it up to the next level. But when you start moving into a third draft, uh, if you haven't gotten there yet, something's gone wrong. Uh, third draft, you need to clean up things and make, you know, improve some dialogue, improve this scene, that scene. But if your architecture isn't in place, after two drafts, you started writing too quickly. Okay, we're almost out of time, so I'm gonna end with a two-pronged question. One is a little bit more um, grounded, which is to say what lies ahead for you in terms of what you're working on and what you hope to be working on, and then maybe something a little more existential. Um, and maybe- w w Will I be working on? <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that, enough. <laughs> that could work, but what, I guess, what do you hope for cinema in the future? if you have any hopes at all for it. <laughs> uh, well, uh, right now I've written something. I'm in the, I've just started it on the second draft. And uh, it, uh, this character I've dealt with over the years, I've, uh, I think it's time for him to put out a skirt. So I want to write a female version which changes virtually everything when you're talking about uh, sexual repression, guilt, frustration. You know, all of a sudden you see it in the female context. It's a whole new. So that's what I'm sort of hoping to do. Um, and then, um, uh, as far as the future, I mean, I don't think audiovisual entertainment is going to go away. You know, it's, it's constantly sort of changing. But as I said to Scorsese once when he talked about preserving film, I said, well, why should we preserve film when we can't preserve the people who are going to watch it? <laughs> so that's the, the long-term answer. <laughs> <laughs> I guess maybe that, I mean, we have like two more minutes. <laughs> it's, a, it's a real question though. It's, it's something I think about a lot. I remember, um, you know, I worked for Marty for, for about 10 years and I remember one time going out to the young interns and saying, Duel in the Sun is playing at MoMA. Who wants to come with me? And they all just were like, we don't want to go. And I'm like, it's, it's like, what are you doing here? <laughs> but, um, do you have any sense of how that audience could be recaptured? Can they? Are we past? Are we past that? Well, you know, movies had a, a hegemony for many, many decades on audiovisual experience. They don't anymore. Uh, in fact, they are almost comp competitive with video games, you know, and uh, all of the other forms of audiovisual entertainment. There, was, there were decades there. If you wanted to see audiovisual entertainment, you had to go in a dark room with a bunch of other people and see an image projected against a wall. So uh, that is never going to come back again. Uh, and uh, the multiplicity of 
audiovisual experience is only going to continue to fracture as you know we get closer and closer to um, the, well, the you know, three dimensional, not three dimensional, but uh, like virtual reality, yeah, metaverse, multi dimensional <laughs> virtual reality <laughs> cinema, uh, and uh, and now I just saw downstairs. I was looking at my phone, uh, Bruce Willis. Oh, he, they've ho they they they've recreated he, him or no, something. No, no, he just licensed his image for deep fake. He oh. sold it for deep fake. So that he now his family will keep getting money as he does commercials with deep fake. And, and the first time I heard this, I, I was working maybe 20, 30 years ago with Bob Brando. And Brando said, the first time I ever heard this, Brando said, I was with Dick Pledge, and he said he just came back because he just had his face scanned. I said, well, why would you have your face scanned? He said, for the commercials, of course. <laughs> and you know, my, my model was way ahead of the curve on that one. <laughs> well, I want to thank you, Paul, for taking some time to talk with us all today. And for all of you, there's a screening of Master Gardener tonight. I believe there's still tickets available, so if you haven't seen it, please go see it. It's the tension. It's a tense, interesting movie that you should see and then talk to your friends about and then continue to get more people to see it because I do think it'd be nice to have an audience watching movies again. <laughs> uh, thank you.